been uh I was looking at my channel the other day and I realized that I haven't made a firearm video in over five months. Uh the reason behind this is I have actually been a firearm technician in the field for about close to three years now. And between that and trying to study level four fire protection, there's really not a lot of time to to make videos about things. Um <clears throat> but just last week I was on a vigilant MX1 training course. So I decided it was a really good time to make a video about the Vigilant MX-1. This panel here has been in my collection for just over a year now. It's actually been featured in a couple of videos, but not directly. So there's a couple of shots of it, but it's never been featured in its own video. This panel is called the MX-1. It's uh, manufactured by Johnson Control Industries which was used to be Tyco, uh, but was uh, taken over by Johnson Controls. And it's quite a powerful panel. So this was an operation in my shed for about a year. It was doing linear heat, it was doing a uh, manual call point and a smoke detector. The reason I decided to pull it out was because after doing the course, I realized something very quickly. And that is that this panel has a very steep learning curve when it comes to user logic. So I figured it was best to pull this panel out and configure it as a test panel so I can keep my knowledge up on the user logic and, and how to program the panel. Because if I don't use the knowledge that I've gained from this course, I will most definitely use it. Unfortunately, the MX1 panel is kind of seen as a proprietary panel in New Zealand. Like, people will see it and they say, oh, that's a worm old panel, which is a subsidiary to JCI. So, people will look at it, they'll kind of get scared and they'll be like, no, I don't really want to program that and don't feel comfortable sort of thing. So, with my company, if we come across one of these panels in an install, we'll actually quote to remove it and put in like a notifier panel, which is the main brand that we use. It's a, it's a real shame after learning the power of this panel and, and what it can provide. Um, the one thing I will say about this is that it's very powerful. So I can pretty much configure this panel to do anything. All the LEDs on the front display, all the LEDs on the motherboard are completely programmable. Uh, just to mention a, a few knacks about it. So I could even program this. Obviously it's not compliant. I could program that if that fuse there blows, it will set off the alarms for 30 seconds, then reset it, sort of thing. <clears throat> so it's a very flexible panel because you can pretty much program it to do anything. But the, the problem with that is that if you don't know what you're doing, you can, you can really mess things up. Um, just for an example, this is a test panel that I've designed, right? So I didn't want to have batteries in it. So I actually reconfigure the controller points so that the batteries are not logged as a fault at all. So even though this panel has no batteries, you you won't see any defects. The panel just thinks it's normal. Now, that that's pretty cool if you want a test panel, but if you're doing a real install and you accidentally remove those controller points or make them non-logged, then you're in big trouble. So... The summary of this panel is it has a lot of cool features, but if you don't know what you're doing, you can really go against code and, and mess things up quite seriously. Um, so some of the things that I learned on this course that makes this panel stand out from other manufacturers, obviously every manufacturer has its ups and its downs, but for Vigilant, the main things that I noticed are sub points. So, Let's say, for example, I've got a Petronics panel. I've got a four input, four output module. That is going to take up eight addresses on my loop. If I was to get the same module for this panel, it's just going to take up one address, but it's going to use eight sub addresses to, to, to achieve that. Um, kind of hard to explain without going into an in-depth tutorial, but essentially it works like IP addresses, right? You've got your main IP net, and then you've got a subnet, and so on and so forth. It, that's kind of how it works. So you've got your, your main point, which is the physical point that's installed on the loop, and then under that you've got your sub-devices, such as LEDs, um, inputs, outputs, are all considered a sub-address. 
The other really cool feature about this is the IR control. So all the new smoke detectors that came out, the 850P, the 850H and the 850PH, they all have IR compatibility. So you can put this, in this panel, you can turn something on called IR command, and you can get a, a remote tool, you point it at the smoke detector on the roof, and you can read the device address, you can readdress the device, and I think you can even test the device. I'm not too sure on that one. Um, but during this training course, I got to spend a bit of time with that device. Really cool, really cool stuff. So those are the main standout features about this panel is flexibility, the IR control, the uh, the loop itself is quite fast responding, which is good. So the Petronix uses something called Clip. It's quite slow at responding, but this uh, th this loop uses frequency shift, which seems to be quite quick in responding. And the other feature is the um, the wireless tool for reading and addressing smoke detectors. Okay, I feel like I've done enough talking now. Uh, let's get this panel plugged in and show you some of the features. You may have noticed this ominous aerial on the top. And that's another feature is there is a printer output directly on the motherboard. You're not going to be able to see the text on there, but that's the module there. This is a wireless RS-232 module. It was featured in my hotel fire alarm test video where I was walking around remotely and uh, checking things. All it is, it's a wireless RS-232 module. I bought it from AliExpress. Amazing thing. Um, just makes life a lot easier when it comes to field testing and uh, BWF inspections. So yeah, if we go into the other room quickly, we'll see that I've got a thermal printer set up. And at the moment, the paper is completely clear. And there's the other side of the wireless transmitter. So I've got the printer configured on this MX-1. All the events that happen during this video will be printed onto that thermal printer. <clears throat> so some of the features that I've added because it's a test panel is I've added a DIN connector there and that is for the loop. And I've added a handle, which conveniently I went to Mitre 10 the other day. They had a handle exactly the same color as the enclosure, which just worked out perfect. And then on the side, you've just got a, a really quick and easy power input. So the point of this panel is to be able to be powered up and tested as quickly as possible, efficiently and, and, and quickly. <clears throat> so let's go ahead now and grab this power cable and plug it into the panel. And there we go, now the panel has power. Easy as that. We will open the devices that I have here. So I've designed, this is <clears throat> something I took inspiration from uh, from the course. So he had a similar case set up with a few devices in it. So I've gone ahead and done the same thing. This is not as advanced as the one I was using on the course. The one that I had on the course had like an apartment module where it was set up for type five training. But this is all I had on hand, so it's it's better than nothing. So it will give you type 5 training, but you don't get to mess around with the apartment module and, and zone 900 and, and, and all that stuff. But yeah, good enough. Unfortunately, the case is too thin, so it doesn't actually fit the smoke detector in it. So you have to put that in separately. But we can get that out easily enough and put it in. Finally, we need to plug our loop into these devices. So the DIN 5 connector has a port on here, which just goes in like so. And the other side goes into the top of the fire panel. Really easy. Okay. With those two things connected, we can now power on the panel. We may get a fault, which will be uh, something called startup flags. So if we go to faults right now, we can see that startup flags. If you're used to working with Notifier, you'll know that when the system first reboots, it goes through system initialization. That's exactly what this is on the Notifier, uh, on the Vigilant, sorry. It's startup flags saying that this system has just started um, doing some self-check sort of thing. And there we go. We are now in a normal condition. 
So we'll go to the printer now and see if anything printed out, which it has. And we can see we have a few things here. So we can see it's cold started. It's enabled fault routing, which was for those startup flags. Common routing, just saying through fault routing. The keypad was enabled because the door is open and keypad access level two, again, because the door is open. Okay, let's do a demonstration. So on here, I've set up input two to activate something called the gas module, gas shutdown module. So this RIM800, which is a relay interface module, is acting as a gas, uh, gas shutdown relay. This, just for training purposes, directly shuts down that relay. So if we trigger that, we'll see that the relay has activated. <clears throat> There's no fire condition because it's not causing a fire on the panel. And all it says is system off normal. We go into menu, recall, points, sorry, all points. We will be able to see eventually that the gas shutdown is an active input. And that is why the system is not normal. We restore this now. The relay will self restore and the system will go back to normal. <coughs> if we check the printer, we can see that it's printed those events. So we can see we got ga gas shut down here, gas relays have turned off, gas shutdown has restored, and gas relays have restored. Okay, let's go ahead and trigger a fire alarm. You can see the gas relays have shut down because there's a fire alarm condition. <coughs> reset the call point and we'll reset the system. Okay, if we go back to the printer, we'll see that it's printed all the activities from what's just happened. So we've got type two and three, which is the zone has activated. The device that's activated, which is the call point, <coughs> and yeah, so on, so on. This prints a lot. It prints every single little detail about the panel, which is really helpful during uh, BWAF testing. So what I'm going to do during in the future is every MX1 panel I come to, I'll plug this printer in. I get the test log of exactly what I've tested, and then I will put it inside the building book. Um, so it's physical evidence of the devices you've tested and that you've tested them properly, essentially. Okay, uh, something else I want to demonstrate is the smoke detector. So I've set this up with user logic to be type 5 when it first starts, and if you do not reset the point within 30 seconds, it will go into full-blown evacuation. Now, the Tyco MX1 devices have really good algorithms in place to prevent false alarms, so in order to test this device efficiently during BWAF inspections, you need to put it into something called commissioning mode. The, the whole panel goes into commissioning mode. 